So in our previous video, we kind of established the idea that you might have two different P's, maybe men and women, maybe Democrat, Republican, whatever it may be. And you may be looking to compare those two groups to each other on a certain issue. Um, and we learned last chapter how to do sampling distributions and confidence intervals for that difference of two proportions. So we basically hit chapter seven and chapter eight again, but now with two parameters in them. We're jumping now into significance testing for a difference in proportion. So it's basically like the chapter nine version of a problem with two P's in it. And in order to test um, a hypothesis on your difference P1 minus P2, you've got to set a few things in place first naturally. First thing you need to do is actually know your hypotheses that you're going to be trying to test. So you will need an HO and an HA, null and alternative, just like you would do in a one parameter test. Now, as far as the hypotheses go, there are two different ways that you can choose to write them. Remember the null hypothesis is something involving equality, and it's a statement of no difference. That was a phrase I used last chapter. A statement of no difference in this context would mean that your two proportions are the same. Democrats and Republicans believe the same thing on this issue. The same percentage of them are in favor of whatever is going on or whatever the situation may be. So one way of writing your null hypothesis is simply that your first proportion is the same or equal to your second proportion. That would be a totally adequate way of saying your null hypothesis. And then if you do it that way, your alternative is going to be that P1 is either greater than or less than or not equal to P2. So this is one approach you could use in writing your hypotheses. I do think this one makes more logical sense, but I'm going to still advise you to do it this second way in green here. What I recommend you do is take your first one right there, P1 equals P2, and subtract P2 to the other side. So I'm going to write that actually as P1 minus P2 equals zero. I like this method because it gets across the points that when we're looking at like a normal distribution and stuff, that number zero is going to be pretty important to us because that's what happens when the two parameters are equal to each other. So I like that it throws that zero in your face. It also has it in P1 minus P2 format, which is what we saw last video when you're looking at a difference in proportions. And if you do it this way, um, you would end up having the same sort of idea, P1 minus P2, either greater, less, or not equal to zero. Either way is totally acceptable, full credit on the AP test. I like the green better, even though it's a little less elegant than the red. So you're going to set up your hypotheses. Hey, I don't think there's a difference for the null hypothesis. And then, oh, trying to find evidence there is a difference for the alternative. Then we jump over to our test statistic. We need to find the test statistic for this problem, which would be where we mark our normal curve and find our area for the p-value. It still is going to be a Z. It's a normal distribution. We showed that last chapter or last video. So we know we're still dealing with a Z test statistic. And let's review how this formula works. Test statistics go, I'll write this kind of small because I'm going to need a lot of space here. You take your statistic that you get minus your parameter and you divide by your standard error of the um, statistic. That was our basic format there. If we look at this problem and think about what's going on with the difference in proportions, our statistic is that P1 hat minus P2 hat, my first sample um, percentage minus my second sample percentage. So within this kind of fraction right here, this part I'm gonna write a little bigger, I'm gonna have a P1 hat minus P2 hat. That is the statistic. The rest of it is a tiny bit more confusing. The key with significance testing is this built-in assumption that actually your two parameters are the same. When you do a significance test, your null says, hey, there's no difference between these two p's. 
So if there's no difference between the two P's in the problem, my parameter, you would think you would use P1 minus P2. That would be logical. It's what's written right here for what we're testing in the first place. But you're actually going to use a zero for this instead. Because if they're the same, P1 minus P2, I have it right here. It's actually equal to zero. So that part ends up working out in our favor. Okay, so our parameter in this problem is assumed to be zero because we're assuming there's no difference and our P1 and P2 are actually equivalent. The denominator is a tiny bit more weird. So what's going on with the denominator? We have our two separate fractions. Oh, I got my fraction for men and my fraction for women and what they thought on this issue. Well, in our null hypothesis, we're assuming the groups are no different from each other. The men and the women are the same on this issue. The Democrats and Republicans are the same on this issue. So it's kind of a weird thought, something you probably wouldn't have thought to do yourself. But let me try to talk you through the rationale here. Let's say I had, I don't know, I asked women and men some survey question. 20 out of 70 women agreed with me. And uh, 25 out of 40 men agreed with me, whatever I was asking them. I've got those two numbers going on right there. So the idea is, according to our null hypothesis, men and women are the same in this problem. They should agree in the same amounts. So rather than having two like smaller samples, oh, I've got a sample of 70 and I've got a sample of 40, my two groups are supposed to be the same. So what I should do, instead of having two smaller groups, I should sort of dump them into one big pot and make this just one big sample. Because the groups are the same anyway, and more data for my sample is better. So what they do is not how you actually like add math fractions mathematically, like you would need a common denominator and stuff. We're not doing that. We're just saying, all right, we got 110 people, and overall, 45 of them agreed with me. Weird idea. But you take your two separate proportions and just dump them into one box. That is called the combined proportion. So when you look at your denominator here, before we used to see P1 hats and P2 hats down here. Like if you look at the confidence interval lesson we just finished. Here what you're going to end up seeing is P with a C on it for combined proportion. You're probably not super in love with this idea right here. But it is how it's done mathematically. We do keep it over N1 and N2 when we do these. So I'm going to have PC hat, P1 one minus PC hat for both of these. But you keep it over your respective N1 and N2. Again, the idea is if I've got more data and I put it together, I'm going to get a better idea of what that percentage actually is. Like if you look at the men and the women in my made up example here, pretty different. Women are under 50%, men are over 50%. So we're just pooling that data that's supposed to be the same together, and we get a more precise estimate. When you look at your formula sheet, I'm going to pull that up real fast if I can find it down here. This formula sheet writes it in kind of a crazy way. So you're going to want to look right, oops, can't highlight it, right here on the formula sheet. It's almost the same thing as what I have written down. When P1 and P2 is assumed, equals P2 is assumed. That's what our significance test does. What they did is they ended up factoring out the numerator. They like did a GCF kind of a thing and pulled that out and left just the 1 over n plus 1 and 1 over n plus 2. I don't love that it's written this way on your formula sheet. It seems to me like one extra step like that you have to try to understand. But it's just know that it's the same thing as what's written down right here. You're going to want to avoid using this formula whenever you're able to. It's just tedious. It's a lot. This is going to be calculator time for the most part when we're actually evaluating and getting our verdict on our conf um, significance test. But you do need to be familiar with that idea of a combined proportion. Our conditions are going to be the same as what we did the last time. You still need to make sure you have random independent samples. Or instead of random independent samples, you have random assignments to treatments, which is by nature independence. 
you need to check your 10% conditions separately, just like before, unless you're doing an experiment. So if you're doing an experiment, this is gonna be basically, you need to check that when you're sampling. If you do an experiment, you're not sampling from the population. So that sampling without replacements doesn't come into play. So for experiments, you actually get to skip the 10% condition. And then our third condition is gonna be our good old friend, the large counts, but we do have to check all four of them. Even though we have this new P combined, you still check them separately when you're doing large counts. So just like before, you're looking at N1, P1 hats, N1, one minus P1 hats, N2, P2 hats, N2, one minus P2 hat. All of those guys have to be greater than or equal to 10. And we'll wrap this up by just doing one kind of full four step right here where you guys see what's going on with this in action. Again, I'm going to recommend you actually try this out and pause and see how you do with it. But then I will jump in and just sort of show you some highlights on what's going on. So we are going to look in this problem at um, two different preschool programs, I believe. Or we have a preschool program for low income families. Um, and then we have kids who did not end up going to this preschool program as well. 62 children went to preschool. And then 61 didn't go and they were kind of the control group for this study. So by its nature, we do have those two separate groups going on. We got the preschool group and we have the didn't go to preschool group. And we're gonna end up looking at what happens to them with regards to need for social services later on in life. What you see me doing right here, I recommend you kind of circle numbers that are important in the problem and try to get your P hats ready to go. In this problem, 38 of the preschool group, and there were 62 of them, ended up um, needing social services or having social services versus 49 out of 61 in the control group. So we would want to know when we do a significance test, is there convincing evidence that those two percentages that we just got are different from one another? So if I actually go and divide these out right here, 38 out of 62 is gonna be about a 61%. So 61% of the children from these lower income um, homes who attended preschool eventually ended up needing social services down the line versus we have 49 out of 61, which is like an 80%, 80.3%. 80 so off the cuff, that does seem like kind of a big deal. 61% versus 80%, could that have happened just by chance where they are the same? The rate's the same, we just picked a lucky sample. Or is it where the preschool program actually did make a difference for them down the line? So setting up our four step right here, you're gonna make sure you signify what your alpha is gonna be. We're doing a 0.05 significance level. And I set up my hypotheses here. Again, I pointed out, I like doing the P1 minus P2 way better, but you could have written right there, P1 equals P2, and that would be cool too. For our alternative, it was suspected that this preschool program would be helpful, meaning less of the participants would end up requiring social services. That's just kind of from the wording of the problem right here. It says, does this provide convincing evidence that preschool reduces the need for social services? That's why we went with a less than in our alternative. If P1 minus P2 is less than zero, P1 is smaller. You're gonna get a negative number in other words. So that's why we went that way for our alternative. And do not forget to define your variables. Again, feel free to take liberties with like little squiggles for parts that are the same, but not on the actual AP test. Write it out on that day. So we define variables, we set up hypotheses, we mentioned alpha, that was good. Then we go to our conditions. This time, it was gonna be random assignments to treatment. They didn't pick kids out of their homes and be like, hey, you're going to be in this program that I'm doing with preschool. They took volunteers or people who signed up to be in it. So since this was not random sampling, we were doing an experiment. We actually randomly assigned them, hey, you're not going to get this preschool or you are. So there was random assignments. That means random assignment is independent by nature. We're good there. 
The 10% condition, we're just going to gloss right over that. We didn't sample from the population, so we don't have to worry about passing 10%. And then I checked all my n times p's and n times 1 minus p's for this problem. They're all greater than or equal to 10, which is good. It means our distribution is approximately normal. Those words approximately normal need to be on your paper. Then we would choose between either doing the formula way, probably not going to recommend you do that unless you're forced to, like on a multiple choice question or something. Should you do that, though, just a few highlights. Notice that the graph is centered at zero. It's centered at zero because that's the assumption that they are the same. The two groups are the same. So that's why we would look at zero as our center. We got 61 versus 80%. I showed you guys that earlier, 61 versus 80. So our sample proportion was negative 19%, negative 0.19. We wanted to know how rare negative 0.19 is that's why I have a line right there at negative 0.19, and we had a less than alternative. Then we just set up a normal CDF, the mean is zero, that was easy. The standard deviation would require us to do this monster back up on the previous page. So we were looking at right here for that guy, not a fan, but to point out what you would end up doing for it, for our pooled or combined sample, we would want to take our 38 and our 49 out of 61 and 62. So if we actually add those together, that looks like 87 out of 123. This would be what I'd use for the combined proportion if I was going to do the formula way. Let's talk calculator, though. If I go to calculator options here, you probably can figure out which one it's going to be. I did not have you write that above, and I need to, but it's going to be number six, a two-proportion z-test. Just like before, it's going to ask you guys to type in your little fractions, putting them in order. We had 38 out of 62 for the preschool group, and we had 49 out of 61. And then we went over to here, and it was going to be a less than for our alternative. Once you set that up and hit enter right there, it'll set up your little significance test. The things you need to make sure that you extract from this problem when you're setting it up, you need to get the name of the test written down, two prob z tests. You need your test statistic, which is that negative 2.32 right there. And you need your p-value, which your calculator, remember, just calls p. You're gonna write p-value, it's about 0.01. 0102 if you want to round it. So that is going to lead us into our script for our conclusion right here. Our p-value is less than our significance level. That is a good thing in terms of finding convincing evidence. We're going to reject HO and there is going to be convincing evidence. You can either go just really, really like, I don't know, bland with it and say there's convincing evidence that P1 minus P2 is less than zero in context. Or the better thing to do would be to put it back in terms that you would like explain to another person. There is convincing evidence that the proportion of kids in the preschool program who needed social services is lower than the proportion of kids not in the preschool program. And that's kind of what I've got worded right over here. The final thing this problem asked for was the scope of inference in this problem. Um, and I did that, where did I do that? Down below right here, describe the scope of inference. That's just talking about where you can apply your results to. And we know that there was no random sampling. So we can't apply this to all kids or all lower income kids or anything. These were volunteers in the program. But because there was random assignments to treatment, this is counting as an experiment for us here. That means we can conclude that the preschool caused the difference in that rate of social services. So same sort of stuff we were learning last chapter just now with two variables instead of one.